I read years ago, a minister came to a church for the first time and he got behind the pulpit. And on the pulpit, there was the sign, Sir, we would see Jesus. It was put there because the board wanted their minister, their new minister, to realize that the purpose was to hear about Jesus. We are here to proclaim Jesus, to underscore Jesus. Years ago, I finished the service and I was greeting people at the door on the way out. And a gentleman came up to me, he wasn't a member of Sunlight, he happened to visit that day, and he came up to me and he said, Pastor, I counted, you mentioned Jesus 53 times in your sermon. It wasn't a compliment. But I didn't want him to know. So I took it as a compliment, I said, thank you. And he looked at me as if I didn't get it. And look, I looked at him as if he didn't get it. Because we're not here to uplift the name of Christopher Columbus or some movie star. We're here to proclaim the name of the one who is called the bright and morning star. And all through the scriptures you will find his name. You find the name of Jesus in so many different ways. He, he's a rock because he's our safety. He's a strong tower because he's our defense. He's a shepherd because he leads us. He's our hiding place. He's the lily of the valley, the bread of God, the living water, and the door. And so many other names. There's so many hints and shadows and metaphors in Scripture that describe Jesus. In fact, there's an interesting one in the fifth chapter of Revelation. There's 420 elders introduce John to the lion of the tribe of Judah who will open the seals. And John says that when I looked, I saw a lamb slain. That's who Jesus is. He's the lion and he's the lamb. He's everywhere in scripture. So we, we lift up the name of Jesus. And that reminds me of the 12th chapter of John while I was going through it. This is what we read. Now, there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast, Passover. While they were there, they heard that Jesus had resurrected Lazarus from the dead. In fact, the very beginning of the 12th chapter deals with Lazarus sitting at the table whom Jesus resurrected. And so they went up to Philip and he said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now you've got to understand that they are Greeks. They had Aristotle, they had Plato, they had Socrates, and they read, they were hundreds of years old, they, not the Greeks, the Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, about for hundreds of years. And so they were intellectually accustomed to the ways of the Greek, but they had never met anybody who raised somebody from the dead. Socrates didn't. Plato didn't. Aristotle didn't. So I would imagine in the back of their mind when they saw Philip, they said, sir, we would see Jesus. We want to see the one who can raise people from the dead. Philip told Andrew, in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. By the way, that simple little passage is our mission. It's wrapped up in that simple passage. We are here to take people to Jesus, to introduce, to show. It's not always done with words. Sometimes it's done by behavior. But that's the mission. That's the mission of the church, take them to Jesus. So Philip and Andrew tell Jesus about the Greeks, and Jesus' response is absolutely strange. They were looking for the one who raised the dead man to life. And this is what Jesus said. 
And Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And he's now introducing them to a cross. They came to see someone who could bring life. And Jesus is talking about a cross. And he goes on to say, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Now I'm going to show you some seeds. There's a common denominator that all seeds have. There's the wheat seed, there's the sunflower seed, the corn seed, the mustard seed, and the walnut. Even though seeds are all different, what they have in common is a hard shell that protects them. But inside the shell, even though the seeds are all different, the hard shell keeps what's inside from getting out. Because inside, the potential for life has been placed. Now the seed must be planted. If it's not planted, it will stay for thousands of years in that shell and never do anything. But if it's planted in the ground, this is what we discover. Life comes out of death. Now I want you to know that that is illogical. We know that happens. We know the seed is placed into the ground, it disintegrates, and the roots grow, and the stem grows, and the fruit come. But life coming out of death is a paradox. And yet we live with paradoxes all the time. We don't think about them as paradoxes, but, but they are. They actually are what sounds like a contradiction, but it happens to be true. Water puts fires out. Water is H2O. H stands for hydrogen, which is a very powerful explosive. And without oxygen, you can't keep a fire going. Yet when you combine the two, they actually put the fire out that started. That's a paradox. We all know that when we sit at the dining room table and we pour salt on our steak, it makes the steak taste more like steak. It makes potatoes taste more like potatoes. It makes the string beans taste more like string beans. But salt is made out of two poisons. Either one of those poisons would kill you. Sodium, chlorine. But when they are combined, they add flavor to your food. It's a paradox. So it should surprise us when Jesus says, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it's going to stay there alone. But it has to die because if it doesn't die, life can't grow out of it. And that is a paradox. But it has to have a meaning to us. And I guess I could start the meaning off this way. If you want to become a butterfly, you are a caterpillar. And if the caterpillar wants to become a butterfly, the caterpillar must crawl into its cocoon and it dies. Not only does it die in that cocoon, it turns into liquid. It's gone. And somehow God has arranged it in such a way that when he is through with that liquid, it emerges as a beautiful, delicate, lovely butterfly. But the only way to become a butterfly is to die. And Jesus is referring to that process when he talks about the seed falling into the ground and dying. Because if it's not put into the ground, it will never grow. It will never bear forth fruit. 
But there's a problem. There's a problem with dying. When the seed dies, it has to give up its protection. The shell. When we die, we have to give up all of the protections that we have developed to keep people from hurting us. So, Jesus is telling us, you got to give up your temper. You have to give up selfishness. These are things that we use to protect ourselves. You have to give up stubbornness. You have to give up pride. You have to give up bitterness. And even though we don't always look at it this way, these are the things that we, some of the things that we use in order to protect ourselves from others that might hurt us in some way. We, we create a stance to keep them from getting too close. Jesus is saying, give it up. If the shell does not crack open, roots will not grow. The stem will not shoot up. And the fruit will not grow. It's the way. If I don't give up my anger, it's impossible to have peace. It's interesting. Peace comes. Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives it, gives you, give I unto you. But you can't have it. You can't have it and have anger. Something's got to die. Unless I give up my impatience, I will never really understand patience. It actually keeps me from the very thing that I want. I, get, I got to give up the grudge or I'll never have peace. And there are people that are doing the T-berry shuffle trying to keep both alive at the, and they can't be done. But there's something more here. When the Greeks said, sir, we would see Jesus, we need to get to the place where we could see Jesus in places where we typically don't look for him. You know, we would like to find him in the manger. We would like to find him in the carpenter's shop. We would like to find him on the Lake of Galilee. We'd like to find him fishing with his disciples. We'd like to find him walking on the water. But we need to find Jesus in places that we would not expect him. Jesus was found in a fiery furnace in a trial, in a very scary place. So the mission is, can we find Jesus in places that are scary? I want to find him in church. I want to find him when the choir sings. I want to find him when we're singing worship songs. But can we find him? Can we find, can we see Jesus when... We're in the middle of a storm because we're not even looking for Jesus. We're looking to protect ourselves. We're looking to keep from being swallowed up by a wave. We're, we're looking for anything but Jesus. We're not looking for Jesus. And yet that's where, didn't Jesus say, I will never leave you and never forsake you? And doesn't that include when we're going through the storm? Doesn't it include when we have to step into a fiery furnace? Doesn't it include when we're going through a trial? Doesn't that include when we're going through a disappointment? Doesn't that include when the roof caves in and the rug is pulled out from underneath us? It includes it all. Sir, we would see Jesus. I need to see him in the places I wasn't looking for. Now, when Jesus says, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it will produce much fruit. When we, when we, when we understand, and I've just gone through understanding the fact that you have to die, and dying is a very painful thing, and it's a scary thing to die. I wonder, I just wonder, how was Jesus dealing with the fact that he was going to the cross? And he was going to die. Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. 
sometimes we get the feeling that, of course, Jesus can handle everything. He's the Son of God. But he was tempted at all points as we are, but without sin. He faced death. And he says his soul was troubled. And he prayed to his father and said, Father, if it be possible, cause this cup to be removed. I don't want to go through this. That's how Jesus felt. That's what he felt about the very thing he was teaching. I've got to go to the cross. I've got to die. I'm troubled. And I was thinking about that, and I, I, I thought, you know, if, you know, if I, this is how I would think. Lord, okay, I got to give up stuff, but I don't want to give it up. What I would like you to do is I would like you to sanitize my anger. I'll tell you what, we'll call it righteous indignation. How about that? So we won't call it anger anymore. We'll call it righteous indignation. Like we can fool God. Like we can pull the wool over his eyes. Lord, I'd like you to sanitize my bitterness. Because after all, Lord, you know, I'm bitter because of a reason. I've got things that have happened and have hurt me. And my reaction to it is to create this Bitterness. Jesus covers that for us. And he says, cause this cup to be removed. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Because if this is the way, and there is no other way, because even Jesus said, Lord, if there's some other way, there is no other way. The only way is to die to the very things that are hurting us. So, the seed has to be planted. And as soon as the seed is planted, everything goes dark. You cover up that seed with dirt. Have you ever had to live in the dark? You're going through some trial that's dark. Oh, you have the light in your heart. But it's dark out there. You have no idea which way it's going to go. Like It's like, I don't understand this, but I'm living in a home, and now it looks like it's go I'm going to bank be bankrupt, and I got, to lo I got to let go of this and step into a wilderness? Not only are you planted and it goes dark if you're the seed, but you got to deal with bugs that are crawling around that seed. They're there. Have you noticed? Take a handful of dirt, check it around. You see, there's a bugs in around and worms. And the seed has to deal with that while it's dying. But it's the only way to victory. It's the only way to victory. The only way to the promised land is to the wilderness. The only way to fruit is to be buried. Jesus says, but for this purpose I came into this world. For this the reason why I came to this hour. I knew what the will of God was into thy hands I commit myself. Not my will but thine be done. That's why I came. Father, glorify your name that a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. It tells you the intention that God has for us. Get to the place where we're going through a difficult time and, and then at the same time realize that God loves you, God cares about you, and God's working things out for you even though you can't figure out how that you had to be buried and it goes dark and you got to deal with critters that are crawling around you and feelings. 
In the 32nd verse, Jesus said this, and if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. The only reason why Jesus has a crop of saints all over the world is because he was lifted up to die. And his death brings fruit. Out of death comes life. And it reminds me of what Moses said as Moses, actually Jesus said what Moses did. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That serpent in the wilderness lifted up represented the curse that Jesus had to take that belonged to me. And looking, and the people who were bitten by poisonous snakes looked at that snake on a cross were healed. Sir, I would see Jesus because I've been bitten. And I need you. Paul says this, he says, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why would he say that? He said, I don't want to hear anything about it. Anything, I don't want, and, and it's really a hyperbole because he doesn't mean I don't want to hear anything that you have to say. He's saying this, the most important thing about my message is the cross. It's the central issue, the cross. Without the cross, nothing is important. The cross is what brings life. And without the cross, there'll be no life. Without the dying to self, there'll be no victory. And you find flashes of this in Scripture. David wrote, Weeping may endure for the night. When I read through that, I thought to myself, you know, if I were a seed, this is the experience I would have. Weeping is enduring through the night because they buried me. And I don't know what's going on. The shell is cracking. And I don't understand this thing. So weeping endures for the night. But then David wrote, joy comes in the morning. If we don't go through the night, we'll never get to the morning. And it's in the morning when the shoot looks up into the sun and the roots dig down deep into the soil. And the process of victory and life begins to work in our lives. Sir, we would see Jesus. And I guess if I were to wrap it all up, I would be saying this, you need to hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on to Jesus. You need to see him in the pain that you're in. You need to see him in the confusion that you're facing. You need to see him in the wilderness that you're struggling to. You need to see him in the disappointment that surrounds you and the discouragement that is it. You've got to see, I got, sir, I would see Jesus. I need to see Jesus in this. Open my eyes, Lord, to see Jesus. This altar is open. I'll be glad to pray with you. My eyes to you.